This is Friday, February 2nd, 2018. We are in Bedford, Massachusetts at the Edith Norse Rogers Memorial Veterans Hospital. <clears throat> and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Jim Ramsey. Our camera person is Maureen Sullivan. And we are privileged to have with us today David Gollin. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born on October 29th, 1936. And where were you born? Worcester, Mass. And what what community do you currently live in? I live in uh, Edith Memorial VA Hospital in Bedford, Massachusetts. Right. And uh, are you married? No. And do you have children? Yes. How many? Two. Two children. And grandchildren? Three. How old are your grandchildren? Uh, 21 and 20 and uh, I think 10. And do you have any great-grandchildren? Uh, no. Okay. Are they all, is, is your family living relatively close here or are they? Yes, out? about 40 miles. We live in Manchester, New Hampshire. Okay. And where did you grow up? I grew up in Worcester, Mass, until uh, I joined the Army when I was 17 years old. I see. And you were growing up in the uh, in the forties. Um, yes. What was it like in Worcester? Back oh, it then? was great, great, great city, great city. I mean, uh, it was just uh, you could. Uh, they didn't have any malls, then, you know. Uh, so it was great. A lot of people on the street. A lot of, a lot of traffic. A lot of stores opened up and. You know, you could just weave in and out of all the stores and see all the people and see all the, all, all the good things. And my favorite time was Christmas because you could see all the Christmas decorations and uh, see Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a, a thrill to see a, a, a nice little city like Worcester, which is the second largest city in uh, Massachusetts, by the way. So you grew up there with your family, uh, mom yeah. and dad, and you had, you had brothers and sisters? No, not my dad. I didn't know my dad. I see. And, and brothers and sisters? Were I, they, uh, I had, uh, when I was growing up, I had uh, two brothers two and brothers. myself. Were you the, the eldest or? Yes. And you grew, and you went to school in Worcester, I get, or did I, you go to school? I, of course, I went to school. I went to uh, grammar school, and then I went to uh, uh, like a, a boys' trade that was uh, for unruly uh, boys that didn't want to learn in a regular school, so they sent me there. And then uh, after that, they sent me to uh, high school, big high school. A public high school in Worcester. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what led to your uh, kind of deciding to go into the, the military? Well, when I was uh, uh, I was seventeen years old. And I got in trouble with the police. Uh, I was involved in a robbery, armed robbery, and um, my priest got me out because the Korean War was still on, and uh, he made a deal with the uh, court system that if I I go to uh, 
the Army if they would suspend the sentence. But when I got out of the Army, I had six years of probation. Hmm. So where did you, where, where, so where and when did you enter the military? How did that? Uh, in Worcester, Mass. And this was in which, which branch? Army. I was in armor. In armor? Mm-hmm. Meaning tanks? Tanks, yeah. Right. But when you, when you enlist, so you went to a recruiting office? Uh, yes. Did you? The, the uh, sheriff took me down because I had been locked up. Right. So he took me down because I had to take a test. If I didn't pass the test, I was going back to jail. Looks like you didn't well on the test. I passed the test. <laughs> Just Good. barely passed that. <laughs> Good for you. Good. So you uh, so what so when you enlisted, did did you know right then you were going into tanks? Yeah, they uh, they asked me what I wanted, and I told them I said uh, tanks. Can I go in tanks? He said sure. So why did you pick tanks? Well, I saw a movie about tanks. So uh, yeah, so we were talking about tanks and why you wanted, why you knew you wanted tanks. Yes, I saw a movie called Tanks with Steve Cochran as a star. And I said, that's what I want to be, a tanker. And that's what I became. I took eight weeks of uh, basic training and 10 weeks of uh, uh, of uh, tank training. And did that follow basic immediately? Or do I mean you went right to the tank? No, train? I, I had some time off. I had two weeks off uh, before I had to report to uh, Fort Knox. I was stationed at Fort Dix. Fort Dix was the, basic? The old uh, 69th Division with the 6 9 on it, Division. Infantry Division. Is that where you went to basic? Or? Yeah, yeah, I went to basic uh, infantry. Fort Dix is in New Jersey. New Jersey, okay. Mm -hmm. And then you had a couple of weeks off, and then you went to tank school. Yeah, uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. For Ten weeks. So what was tank school like? What well, was very interesting. I I, I really loved what I was seeing, you know, the giant, these gigantic uh, machines, man. I was just so uh, thrilled to be able to learn all about them, you know, uh, everything. I, I was just sucking it up as fast as I could and retaining everything that I possibly could, you know, and uh, I was a different person from when I went to school because I really wanted to learn and um, learn everything about it. I don't know why. I All I know is I wanted to be a driver. A but tank I, driver. A tank driver. And I knew everything about that, those tanks from the engine, transmission, tracks, you you name it, I know it. And in the turret, I, uh, I learned gunnery, I, I learned loading, I learned all kinds of all kinds of things. It was very interesting and I loved every minute of it. Did you know auto mechanics or that sort of thing before you went into the army or had any experience? Yeah, well I, I my uncle used to have a junkyard. So whenever I needed a car, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I would go up there, plus I would steal a car if I needed one, a, a nice looking car, you know, at night, you know, because I didn't want my girl to drive in a, ride in a junk, you know, like my uncle used to have nothing but junk, so he'd be smoking down a road or something, and I didn't want that, I just I used to steal another car. Which was so easy. You, so you you knew something about cars, but uh, I know yeah I know a little bit about cars yeah. So when you joined the army, the Korean War was 
winding down. It was winding down, And yeah. the Cold War was pretty hot. Uh, or was it, it was it really, it might have been hot, yeah. It, it, I didn't know anything about the Cold War or, or Europe or anything like that because when I uh, finished tank school, uh, we had my platoon, which was the second platoon at Fort Knox, had orders to go to Korea. The whole platoon? Yeah, the whole platoon, all at one time, were going over to Korea. Then the very last minute they changed it and they sent us to Germany. And when we got to Germany, they took us to Berlin. And uh, I have to scratch my nose, I'm sorry, I had an itch. Um, when I got to uh, Germany, they sent us to Berlin, like I said, uh, uh, to take over a whole platoon of tanks because all those guys were being discharged. I didn't know, I didn't know what the heck was going on. I, I thought we, I was going to be stationed there in uh, uh, Berlin. But we got in the tanks, we were in the square because the Russians closed off Checkpoint Charlie. They wouldn't let the East Berlin to travel back and forth, or the West Berliners <laughs> to travel back and forth. They wouldn't let nobody go anywhere. They just closed the whole gate off. And when I went there, of course, there was no wall. It was all Constantina barbed wire. And the Const Constantina barbed wire that was set up on the Russian side was um, a maze of Constantina barbed wire, which is in rolls and very sharp. And it was like a, a maze that they had going this way, this way, this way, and out. And it was almost like they, the, the people who traveled back and forth had to walk single file. Well, the first day I, I got there it was in October. Of, of which year, by the way? Uh, 1954. Thank you. Yeah, 1954. The end of 1954. I mean, uh, October 1954. And um, there was a uh, chaplain out in front of all the tanks um, giving them blessings. And I, I, I knew what it was because I was Catholic anyway. And I, I, I said to him, uh, hey, Father, I said, uh, you know, I was sitting in the driver's seat, you know, and I, I opened up the hatch. And I said to him, hey, Father, I said, uh, what's going on there? You know, why are you doing that? He said, I'm giving the last rites. And I says, for what? He said, uh, do you realize how much in danger we are? I said, no, sir. So he explained to me, he said, uh, that if the Russians decide to attack us or we attack them, <clears throat> uh, our, our uh, rate of survival is zero. I go, well, you know, what the heck's happened? I, we, got, we got tanks here. And I, later on I found out that we had like 20 tanks. We have 22 tanks in our, our company, all right? Mm -hmm. But two of them didn't make it. So we had 20 tanks on the line. Come to find out the Russians had 2,000 hmm. behind all those buildings. We didn't know that. I, I, at least I didn't know that. You know, and we were just dumbfounded being still recruits. We don't know. And all we know is that they, they gave us ammunition and, and uh, weapons and said, load up. You know, we're all loaded up for uh, firing, you know. Firing, you say? Yeah, a cannon was loaded and they gave us ammo, you know, because they, they gave me a machine gun and a pistol, a forty-five, And uh, they said, uh, load them up. 
you know, just in case we get attacked. Mm. So I go, oh, okay, you know, you know, and uh, then after a few days, uh, about almost a week, I guess, it subsided, and they opened up the uh, uh, the, the, the checkpoint. And people could travel back and forth, and it was all over. And then we went back to our uh, our base, which was uh, outside of Nuremberg, a small base called Firth, and uh, it was the um, base that was used by the SS troops, and it was uh, one of Hitler's private. Um, Bases. We were stationed in the SS troop barracks, you know, where two men to a room, and you know, it was just beautiful. I mean, beautiful hardwood floors and beautiful painting and on the walls and stuff, you know. And then you see the old uh, German gun racks and stuff that was still there. And we had a little mess hall, and we ate there, and then we did our maintenance on our tanks, and then all of a sudden they said, all right, this uh, second platoon is going on a little trip. Well, I, I'm sorry. Well, we're going to participate in a, um, uh, a make-believe war, which was uh, called um, Cordon Bleu, hmm. where all the divisions in, in Europe got involved in this quarter on blue. A training exercise? Yeah, a training exercise, yeah. And and you're out in the field and and, and all over Germany. I just traveling all over Germany. And then I never went back to my my base. They sent me to first they sent me to uh Hungary. You know, my tank commander and my tank and everything, we went to Hungary. And uh, my platoon, second platoon. And then uh, that happened in um, uh, around April, April 6, 1956. Then they started, uh, Russians started having an uprise in Hungary. And at the same time, the Czechoslovakians were having an uprise in Czechoslovakia. So they said, second platoon had the Czechoslovakia right now on the, on the line. So off we go. I don't know where I'm going. All I know is that the tank commander's steering me there, you know, because we take up maps and everything. So over there in Czechoslovakia, I, I, we landed there and uh, we dug in and uh, um, there was a lot of, a lot of action all over the place, you know, uh, on the Hungarian side, you know. You could see it and, and hear it. So then they started, uh, the, the Czechoslovakians started to come over our side and as they were coming over on our side, the Russians were shooting them. So me and another tanker, we just said, hey, we got to help these people. They're running, they're getting exhausted. They're carrying all their belongings and everything, and they're, they're trying to run over. And it was a long way from where they were to our line, you know, there's a big space there, <clears throat> in an open field. And uh, me and a couple of tankers slipped out the bottom of our tank, and we went down and tried to pull them people up, you know, because it was a slight grade, you know, uh, up toward, because we were up on a hill. But there was a slight grade leading to that, and then once we got them up there, they were, uh, Russians were firing uh, small rounds, you know. Small arms fire? Small arms fire, yeah. So we fired back, I fired back anyway with my machine gun, you know. I, I, of course, 
with the machine gun, it was only like not the actress thing in the world. It only had accuracy about 25 feet, mm. but it had range for about 100 yards. So I just shot it anyway, and just maybe I'd get lucky and hit somebody. You well, know? this 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 had started out as a training exercise, I think you said. It started out as a training exercise. After the training exercise was through, that's when we started. Uh, then we got orders to go to. Okay, okay. Uh, Hungary, got and it. then from Hungary they sent us to Czechoslovakia. They, they my uh, rest of my company stayed in Hungary, and my platoon went to Czechoslovakia on the border. Now, here's a weird thing. When I got there, we're all dug in at certain places uh, around there. We find out that the Germans a dug in a side of us. Germans? Germans, yeah. A German army. They're wearing the helmets, you know, how the, the, the German helmets came down. They're wearing the same uniforms that they wore in the Second World War, the same boots, everything. <coughs> they had the same holsters, but they had our guns, like our 45s and everything, and they had our old tanks. When I got there, we had M47 tanks. I took my training with M46 tanks. I know you don't know the difference, but um, when I got there, the Germans had the M46 tanks. Mm -hmm. We had the M47s, which were a little more designed a little better, you know. Um, then I, uh, I was surprised to see them, you know, but... Uh, what what were they doing? They were guarding the border. Guarding the border. The German, yeah. what, what, the border between Germany and Czechoslovakia? Uh, yeah, Georgia. because of the Russians. Right. Did they, you... In your tank, you just, you basically, when you moved, you just basically rolled down the road, just like a, like a car would do? In other words, getting from Germany to Hungary or Czechoslovakia, that's a fair distance, right? You, yeah. You, you, uh, you would just ride down the highway. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so what happened after, so what happened as a result of these tensions on the borders. So like I said, when they broke out and they started running over to our side, the uh, Hungarians uh, didn't know what to do. I didn't, uh, you know, it's all these people, uh, uh, women and men and children and everything, they're running all across, you know, and um, like I said, you know, I saw them being shot, you know, by the Ru Russians, you know, they're shooting them with small arms fire, and they're, they're hitting our tanks, you know, like with small arms fire, you know, bing, 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 you know, you could hear that. That's why we went out the bottom as we crawl underneath the tank and out right in the front and get down on a, on a hill, and uh, yeah, a few bullets went by my head. Oh. I didn't, I didn't think about that. I was thinking about helping the people get get away from them, you know, get them in back of the tank the best they could. But, you know, I got out of breath, you know, because I'm all excited because I'm shooting back at these guys. It's like I'm in, I'm in a, uh, a, a war, you know. But... My adrenaline was going so much, I, I almost, uh, you know, I was stumbling, you know, pulling people, doing what I could, and at the same time, loading my, my machine gun and firing, you know, and... Uh, so you were basically putting some of these people in your tanks? Not in them, behind them. Behind them, to protect yeah. them. Yeah, right, to protect them, yeah. But were they basically safe? In other words, they had... They were now in, had crossed the border? Oh yeah, they crossed the border. They were, they were pretty safe, yeah. Behind our tanks, because they're not gonna, 
uh, our tanks were kind of like dug in, uh, and, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, camouflage like. Right, right. Backed in our woods <clears throat> between trees and stuff. And the trees that were in back of the tank, they just got tipped over, you know. You just make your own, your own hole. Right. You know, right. so. Uh, and so what did these people eventually do? Did they just, they, they wandered they, off into the countryside? No, no, for? no, no. The, uh, the government sent uh, trucks and, and uh, buses and everything and took them away. I don't the U.S. Know government? Did. Hmm? Yeah, our government. Okay. Yeah, took wow. uh, come took them away. I don't know where they put them, but they took them away. So this was in I think you said in in May of '56. No, April. Sorry, April, April of '56. Yep. And how long? So so let's see. This was. This was like a. You you got over there in October of fifty. Four. Fifty four. So, um, how long were you at the border? Did you then come back to Berlin or N Nuremberg? No, I wasn't stationed in Berlin. I, I was stationed in Firth. Firth. Uh, we came back once in a while. I, I was out there, uh, I, I would say out in the field, according, uh, even with the, uh, uh, the exercise, I'd say about 18 months, 17, 18 months, mm. yeah, in the boonies, you know, shaving and coffee and stuff like that, you know, <laughs> yeah. So that was, uh, what did you eat? What, 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 uh, what did you do for food? We ate out of cans. Basically like sea rations. Sea rations, yeah, sea rations, yep. Yeah. Morning, afternoon, and evening? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner? All the time. We didn't have any mess hall. You had to do it yourself. They would take and uh, bring a truck out with the, with the supplies, and they'd drop it off. And they'd have water. You know, they'd have one of those trailers, little water trailers that they pulled behind them. Right. And uh, we carried two five-gallon cans in the front of our, on the sides of our tank uh, on the outside. And, um, well, you know, on my tank, one was filled with uh, coffee and the other one was filled with water. You know, so right. we, we had to share, we, we couldn't really shave and, uh, you know, wash up in the water because that was scarce, you know. Right. They would leave that, that little trailer out there, you know, uh, for us to use all the time, you know, but water was still scarce, like you couldn't take a shower or anything like that, you know, wash, couldn't wash your clothes. Or. So how'd you make coffee? Well, we had to uh, well, either make it on top of the tank, you know, put, put it on top of the muffler, or we have a, a Bunsen burner. Yes. And you, uh, you light the Bunsen burner up, and uh, we had a, a steel pot. We didn't have any pots and pans. We had a steel pot. Uh, one of our loader had a steel pot. The other, the other uh, tankers didn't have a, uh, a steel pot. We had just um, a hat or a helmets. Uh, you know, tank helmets. You know, and. Um, we just boil the coffee in that, or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, or we would uh, we would just you know cook, right? Uh, you know, open up the cans and and heat them up on the on on the on the muffler, the tank. Right. That thing would get white hot, you know. I bet. When you ran the tank for a little while, and you had to do that every so often to keep the battery charges, uh, the batteries charged up. So, who who were the the people on board the tank? What were the positions? 
We had the driver, tank commander, gunner, and loader. And you were the driver? I was the driver. Then they took my tank commander off my tank and sent him home for emergency leave. So there was, uh, instead of four of us on the tank, there was only three of us on the tank. The gunner, the loader, and me. And uh, be, being I, w I was uh, the only NCO on my tank, I had made me tank commander and driver. Hey, well, so, you were doing both, both jobs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I did was, you know, uh, I just get the, uh, the orders, you know, from the command center what to what to do. Mm -hmm. And then I, I would do it, you know, because uh, I, uh, I, before I became an NCO, I had to go to NCO uh, school for a little bit and learn a few things, you know. So what NCO stands for non-commissioned officer? Correct, yeah. I was, uh, first I was a corporal and then they changed it to a specialist third class. They thought they were doing something good. You know. Is that the non-commissioned officer category? Yeah. Okay. I was a specialist. So, uh, with regard to this armor, uh, I mean tanks, mm -hmm. where did you get this training? Uh, this NCO school, I mean, was this training kind of on site or did you go someplace to be trained? Oh, when I was in Garrison, uh, you know, uh, uh, one time I was in Garrison, we had to come back for a uh, uh, <coughs> Inspector General inspection. Is this back in Firth? Yeah, back in Firth. We come back to Firth <coughs> and had that had that done, and uh, they said to me, uh, "Colin, you're going to be a corporal, so come on, you got to take a test." I said, test, I didn't even study. That's all right, you'll pass. And I did, I passed. So you had been, what, a private? Or private first class? Before you became corporal? I was a PFC. Okay. Yeah. And then after corporal, you became a specialist. Well, they, they changed. They took the corporal strikes away from us and made us all specialists. Okay. Okay. And is that what you remained yeah. for the rest of your tour? Yes. And then when I came back to the States, we gyroscoped the whole division in October of 1956. And that's when I saw the uh, uh, Andrea Doria uh, Go on the water and uh, the Stockholm. You, uh, we just came out uh, and uh, we're going through where where they collided, and we saw. I saw the ass end of the Andrea Doria. We had to wait out there until it sank. So you were on a ship heading home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So this was in October of '56, did you say? Correct. So this, was, this was basically two years after uh, you got there. Basically, yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. And um, when I got back, I was uh, they assigned me to uh, Fort Carson, Colorado, mm. Colorado Springs, and when I got there. Uh, I had reported to uh, my my company, tank company, 39th Infantry. Uh, it was still the same division, same company, same everything. When I got there, there was nobody there but the uh, uh, officers and and the men like uh, I was stationed with, and they said uh, we're going to train. Recruits. So I thought, well, tank training. I know tank training. They said, no, infantry. Infantry? What the hell do I know about infantry? 
And all the takers are saying, yeah, what the hell do we know about infantry? You know, the company commander says, you took eight weeks of basic training, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. There you go. You've already been trained for it. Holy mackerel. Uh, we need refreshing courses. Here's a book. Read it. Uh, when we when we stopped, you were talking about your time at Fort Carson and getting into, uh, apparently, infantry training. <laughs> yeah. So how'd that work out? <laughs> Well, at first it was like a Chinese fire drill. <laughs> That's the only way I can explain it. But then we got really down to it, you know, because we were really like, uh, we, were, we were soldiers. And we knew we had a job to do. The only thing is that we, uh, you know, we, uh, our uniforms were a little different, you know. Uh, they had tie-up boots and we had straps on our boots, you know, and they wondered why we were different. And I told them because we're tankers, you know. But anyway, they made me a platoon sergeant. And uh, as I uh, taught my, my, my troops what to do in the barracks and stuff like that, and then I had to give them rifle training and how to take apart the M1 rifle and put it together, and, you know, make your bed and tighten it up and do this and straighten out your your lockers, your foot locker, and you know, I, that that kind of stuff was good. And then we started marching, and um, we were in good shape as far as soldiers go. You know, the the what we called the cadre, actually. Uh, the DIs or cadre, and um, we were in really good shape, so we could march five miles. But they had to carry heavy packs. We didn't carry any. We didn't need them. You know, they would have to carry their full field packs. We had to get them in shape. See. So was it was this basic training? Yes. Okay. Basic training. So we had to give them all basic training, night training, day training, all kinds of training. If I might take a minute, uh, you just to step back a bit, you told us briefly about uh, coincidentally being in the same place where the Andrea Doria and the Stockholm were. Could you tell us a little more about that experience? Uh, okay, uh, let me rewind a little bit. Uh, we just, our ship just came out of one of the worst storms ever in the, in the North Atlantic. I mean, with, I'm not kidding you, 100 foot waves, the captain told us. We, was, we spent more time underwater than over the water. And then when it got smooth, they let us up on deck. Uh, but the, 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 uh, the ship stopped. You know, we heard it, we, we heard the, the screws because I was in the back of the ship. That's where I slept. And uh, I heard the, uh, the screws stop. So I don't know what the hell's going on, you know? I don't, we don't even know where we are, you know. But we're just entering U.S. waters, they said. And uh, there's a problem out there. So we went. They said that we could go outside, you know. So we bugged for the the stairs and climbed up, boom, up there and went out on deck. And what the hell is this? There's a big ship with the butt sticking out, you know, and Andrea Doria never heard of the ship. Then the Stockholm ship, a beautiful white, sleek ship out there with the front torn off. And we're trying to get information on it, what's going on. But we had to not get too close to the Andrea Doria because it was going to sink. 
And the uh, captain said, we don't know how long it's going to take for it to sink, so we have to be, uh, get away, uh, stay away, because we don't know what's, what's going to happen. Because this ship was big, 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 had a big, big butt. And it was about, oh, I'm going to say, I don't know, I can't remember, maybe, maybe 35, 40 feet underwater when we saw it. You know, just enough to see the props. The props were sticking out, that's all. And the back, that's it. Well, the, the props, the props were in the back and our ship was over here. And so we could see the props in the back. We couldn't see the front, uh, top of the ship at all. Couldn't see the top of it. It was like all underwater. And there were people in, in boats, you know, lifeboats, but they had ships that were picking them up, picking people up on the lifeboats. We did not have room for them because we had all our troops coming from uh, Europe on two ships. One ship was way back. Uh, it was the William O. Darby, and I was on the Bruckner ship. I was on the same ship that Elvis Presley went over on. I came back on the same ship he was on. Uh, when he when he went over to Europe, when the Third Army came over to Europe, <laughs> that division went over that way. And being that I was attached to the Ninth Division, I was still in the Third Army. And they asked if we wanted to go back to the Third Army or go back to the States. I said, I'll go back to the States, pal. I've had enough of this. Uh, Shotzi stuff, you know, Fraulein, I'm almost, I'm all set. So you saw the, uh, did you actually see the ship finally sink? And no, they made us go back inside. They made us go back inside because it was going fast then, and they told us get off the deck, clear the deck. So we had to clear the deck. Right. So what was your most memorable experience of your time in Germany? Or a memorable experience? Or memory? I have several. Uh, a lot of it is that how beautiful that country was. And uh, the, the historic landmarks that are there, like the castles and the <clears throat> old cobblestone streets and stuff like that, you know. I got, I got to back up and tell you a story, though, uh, a quick story. When I first went over there, uh, you know, after uh, the Berlin um, uh, incident, we, co we come back to Garrison, and now we're going back out to the field. I'm in my tank, and I'm going through Nuremberg, and it's raining like the bats of hell. And uh, of course, I'm outside, you know, my body is outside, and I'm going straight ahead, all the tanks are turning this way to the left, to the left, to the left, and I'm going, and we're, I'm wide open, I'm doing about 35, 40 miles an hour, hmm. you know, in, in the rain. And I, t the stick is over here, and the stick is also the shift. You can shift and steer at the same time, you know, the tank. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it's under under me. I'm up here, and it's under me like this, and I'm driving, and I'm just like daydreaming, you know, and uh, thinking about the rain and, and how slippery those cobblestones are. So. When it comes time for me to start turning, I can't turn. It won't turn. I'm pulling the stick over, turn, turn, turn. It won't turn. And the cannon went right through a, a bar. <laughs> I ran over a motorcycle because it wouldn't steer. <laughs> it went right 
the cannon went right through the bar and trashed the whole front of it down, you know? And there were people inside, and the sergeant says to me, Gullen, back up and get the hell out of here right now, you dumbass. I said, okay, Sarge, I'm sorry. <laughs> he said, what happened? I said, I don't know. He said, did you put it in low? I said, no, I had it in high. He said, that's why it didn't steer, you dumbass. Are you sure you're a driver? I had to throw you out and <laughs> throw you under the tracks. I said, I'm sorry, Sarge. You know, my sergeant was my platoon sergeant, too. He was a big guy, big guy like John Wayne. His name was John Cordell, and he was a mean son of a gun. But he liked me after years, you know, we got along pretty good. And I missed them, you know, when they took him off the tank. So you didn't get in trouble for that, other than a good Yeah, we had to, lashing. no, no, my company had to pay for the building. Because <laughs> we have a, um, um, uh, a slush fund hmm. for repairs, like if we knock down one of their trees and they don't want us to, they charge you for the tree, you know. One time, I went through the Black Forest with no lights on, and it was at night. And I was the lead tank, and out of 20 tanks, I was the only tank that got through without knocking off my mufflers or bending a fender or hitting a tree. And, that's, that's and my tank commander said, because the lieutenant wanted me as his driver. Oh, I got a, a cramp. Cramp, yeah. Uh, you got a, uh, he, he wanted me as his driver, and he goes, oh, no, sir, you're not getting my driver. You know, oh, no, 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 he's, he's a good driver. He goes, yeah, he's the only one that went through the Black Forest without a, uh, a scratch. So aside from destroying the bar, you did no other damage with your tank? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we tear up the road, right? You know, by turning and stuff. You know, tearing up all the cobblestones and big pile of cobblestones laying on the side of the road. Hmm. I hit a honey wagon one time, which was. Uh, I, you really want me to tell these stories? Well, one more. Okay, one more. Uh, well, I'm excited about the honey wagon. Well, let, 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 let me go to another story uh, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I was climbing a mountain in the rain and uh, dark, pitch dark, no lights. We drive with no lights anyway. But I, something told me, and it was a narrow road, a tank is 12 feet wide. It takes up a whole road. Hmm. Something told me that there was something coming down the highway the opposite way. And I'm trying to look and I see some marker lights, you know, uh, and uh, it's pitch black, but I can see the marker lights like cat eyes there, see? So I know it's a vehicle, an army vehicle. So when it gets close, I put it in and, and put the tank in low gear and I hard right, hard right, I go like this, wow! Down the hill I go and taking off trees and everything, They're going trees are going all over the place. I'm sliding down the hill because it's all mud. All of a sudden I land in a barn. I go right through the barn, front of the barn, and there's a, a farmer there giving his, his cows hay. Meanwhile, I got a big tree stuck in the front of my tank, which was almost covering me. It was stuck between the gun and the, uh, the cannon and the, uh, the bottom of the tank, you know? So we had to get the tree out. 
So we, me and the other guys, uh, the two guys, would get out. We're trying to get the tree out. Meanwhile, the German is yelling, screaming at me because uh, I, I just ruined his barn, you know? So we, we got the tree out, moved the tree. It was an apple tree. Uh, so we got the tree. I moved it to the side, and we said, mount up, you know? Mount up, and I went out the other side. Of the barn? Yeah, I went going straight out. I'm, I'm, I came back up. I can't see. It's at night. So I go straight ahead. I go straight ahead out out the out the the other side of the wall and somehow my tank tells me that I'm I'm balancing here. So I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I, I go, oh wow, it's balancing. So I creep it up a little bit more and all of a sudden boom. It went down, face down, and splat. It landed in where they shovel all the manure. <laughs> I had manure all over me, inside my driver's compartment, all over the tank. And I, I said, the hell with this? I just put, put it in gear and, and took off. And then I turned hard left and left again and went up the mountain, got back on the highway, and I stink like hell, and the guys are saying, Jesus, call him what you hit? I said, I hit um, manure. That, I mean, that's the polite word I used. <laughs> I said, I said <laughs> that is a, I hit a quite bunch a of manure. <laughs> I can only imagine how fun it was to clean that up. Well, we went to a, a uh, I stopped in a, uh, another outfit, uh, uh, a garrison, another garrison, mm -hmm. infantry garrison. I think it was the 11th Division or something. And I, I stopped in there and they, uh, when I went through, they said, uh, you don't belong here. I said, I am. I'm one of your tanks. I'm assigned to your... Uh, your outfit, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm BSing through my hat through these guys. I want to get in there and get some fuel, you know, and uh, get something to eat and maybe take a shower, you know. We're going to relax here. So I go in the gate, he lets me through, and they, they stop me. And they said, what's up? I said, I, I need some fuel, sir. You know, okay, so they, they got a, a, a gas truck, fuel truck over there, fueled it up, and we said, uh, can we use your mess hall to get something to eat, sir? Because we run out of food here. What division are you in? I says, 11th. We don't have any tanks here. I said, well, I'm, I'm in a different group of the 11th. i just been assigned to the 11th Division. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Got any orders? No, sir. I only know, they tell me on the radio what to do, so here I am. So I have to report to the battalion commander. Well, the battalion commander is not here. He's in, he's in another battalion, the 1st Battalion. This is the 3rd Battalion. Oh, oh, okay. What, what do I care? I don't care. All I wanted is some food and fuel, and hopefully a shower. Well, they, when, when they saw all the manure all over the tank, they go, and you better give your tank a bath too. Boy, it stinks. I said, yeah, okay. So we went over to the mess hall where they got a, a hose, and the uh, guys that were on KP, they rinsed the whole tank off for me while we were inside eating get something to eat, and we come out and they fueled it up for us and everything. Oh, they treated me like gold. Then I rolled out the gate and said, adios. <laughs> Let me see you guys again. That's a great story. <laughs> thank, thank you for that. Uh, kind of now back maybe to Fort Carson. Uh, you were training, you'd been promoted to sergeant. Uh, 
did you kind of wind up your service at Fort Carson? Yes, I did. And were you discharged from yeah. there or? Uh, yeah, discharged at Fort Carson. And when was that? In uh, 57. 50, kind of middle of 57? Yeah, or? June. June, June, okay. Well, the end of June. And you were, uh, you were a sergeant at that point? No. Uh, I got busted back to a corporal by a specialist, third. Okay. And what decorations did you uh, accumulate while in your service? The ones that I know are like the German occupational uh, the Korean uh, medal, the um, good conduct, and the national defense. Mm -hmm. That's all I know. I mean, I have more, but I, I don't know where the... Uh, um, we never got them. They lost our records. Oh. Well, maybe there's some way to to backtrack and find that. I tried. Uh, you I tried. tried. I tried. Uh, me and Pam, we tried. We uh, uh, tracked back the, uh, like, uh, get a, um, a, a 10, 15, instead of a, um, a regular discharge. OK. Uh, What you know, the, like a DD-214, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well, it's a, 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 a DD-215, an upgrade, and on the upgrade it says, because of the fire in Missouri, uh, ah. my records had been destroyed, and there's no way that they can find them. I see. Well, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. So when you left Colorado, did you go back to Worcester? Yeah, I was married. You were you were married while in the service, or you got married? Yeah, no, I was married while I was in the service. Okay. When I came back in October of uh, 56, oh. I met a girl, and I got married in January 56. I got a, um, a two-week pass, got married, and then came back. Uh, Fort Carson and stayed there until my time was up, six months. So when you came, so what were your feelings about coming home, about leaving the service? How'd you feel about that? I'm glad because there was too much going on. Like uh, when I first went in the Army, I had the uh, uh, boots, combat boots with the buckles on the side, and they wanted us, they were brown, they wanted us to shine them. We had to shine them with brown shoe polish. All our shoes were brown, you know, just that was it. And then all of a sudden when I went to Europe, they changed everything to black. Black shoes, black boots, pa 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 Oh, what are you guys crazy? And then, and then they changed it again. They wanted back to brown. And I said to the, uh, as a matter of fact, I met the uh, Secretary of Defense, I believe is he was. And he asked me if I was going to re up, and I said, no, I wouldn't re up in this chicken. Outfit, put nothing. You people are nuts. You don't know what you're doing. One day you want brown, next day you want black. You know, pick up your mind. All those years from the First World War to the Second World War and the Korean War were all brown. Then you change it to black. Now you want them back to brown? No. 
not me. You can have it all. I am not complaining with none of you fool, you know? They wanted us to wear hats like wax because we're tankers. I'm not wearing a whack hat. And I didn't either. I wouldn't wear a whack hat. So it was time to go. Time to go. Did you did you join the reserves or any of that? I was already in the reserves. You were in the reserves. Yeah. So did you have did did you have some continuing obligation? No, all I had to do was uh, sign in, tell them that I'm here, and I was assigned to a, a tank outfit in Springfield, Mass. Hmm. For how long? I think it was for three years. Hmm. So you met periodically? With no, this? no, no, no. Okay. You got to remember, I was on probation for six years. I had to sign in every week, go see the probation officer. And then what I did uh, um, after that, because I got a job driving on a, on a truck, you know, and, and sometimes I wouldn't be able to make that appointment, you know. Um, they kind of, he kind of excused me from reporting there, because he knew me from when I was a kid, you know a probation officer, because we came from the same area, you know, and he knew me. Right. So did you, did you join any veterans organizations, like the American Legion or that sort of thing? DAV. DAV. Mm -hmm. Disabled American Veterans. Yes. Right. And uh, do you, do you, do you, I mean, did you or do you keep a touch at all with members of your old u unit or, or tankers? I mean, do you kind of have any connections still with? The ones that I, I had contact with are all dead. Okay, but you did maintain some? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. So how important to you was your serving in the military? I mean, was that an important part of your life? Yes, it was, actually. You know, at first I just thought it was, you know, uh, I, I'm doing it because I, I got busted, you know? And then I went and I said, you know what? I got to keep my country safe, whatever it takes. If I die, I die. If war breaks out, I'll be there. I'm ready. I'm ready for whatever action. I, and I do mean I was mentally and physically ready to go in combat at any, any time. I was a well-trained soldier. Well, very well-trained soldier. I think that we had the best training of <coughs> of any army in the world, you know, uh, to learn how to survive and think for yourself and, and, and do what you have to do. And, and you don't think of yourself. You think of what you have to do. And, and I always thought, well, if I'm going to be attacked, I know I'm going to be really mad. I'm really going to be mad because I don't want no one stepping on my toes. You know, you know what I'm saying? If they're going to bomb my country, I'm going to bomb their country. If they're going to kick my butt, I'm going to kick their butt. You know, they're not fooling with, with with somebody who's going to say, please don't do this, let's get over it. I'm, I'm ready to die for my country. And when I, when I first went in, I didn't know what to expect. When I went through the first few weeks of basic, I wasn't really feeling that way. When I graduated from basic training, 
I said, what training I got? I'm awesome. I, I got it. I got it. I'm ready for, I'm ready for combat. I'm ready for combat as an infantry man. Then I went to tank training, and I said, you know what? I'm ready for anything because I know how I know how to deploy tanks. I know how to uh, maneuver. And I know how to do a lot of things. I've had the best tank training in the whole world at Fort Knox, Kentucky. I was in the 33rd Tank Battalion at Fort Knox, Kentucky. What a beautiful place, beautiful school. I learned a lot. And to this day, and I'm 82, I still got it. I still got it up here. And I'm still ready to fight for my country. If I could see, I'll do whatever I can for my country and for my fellow man. I learned a lot. I grew up in the service. You know. Well, that was. Uh, thank you for that, and thank you for your service. I mean, really, that was. That's great. You've told us a few humorous stories, memorable stories. Um, is there anything else that you kind of like to share? You know, I mean. As we talk, this is going to go to your family, if you're two people you want to share it with. Uh, anything else you'd like to say? You, you've told us a lot, but if there's anything else, uh, please do. If not, that's okay too. Things that I can't talk about. Um, Uh, you know, but uh, uh, I'm okay. You know what I mean? I do. I'm okay. You are I, more I than don't okay. want to get into anything. Good. You know. That's, you don't have to. You've you've told us a lot. Thank uh, you. It's been a great interview. Thank uh, you. It was my pleasure because I enjoy. Talking about things and, uh, uh, you know, things that happened. Um, I can tell you this, when I got out of the service, that made me want to be an 18, drive an 18-wheeler, which I did for 52 years. <laughs> so, 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 how, so, I was, uh, <clears throat> so how is that compared to driving a tank? Well, it's big, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, I used to haul double and triple trailers, you know? And I hauled a lot of double trailers uh, uh, for um, Coors Beer up in Golden, Colorado, down into uh, Arizona. And um, I, I did that for about seven years. You know, I worked for a company and um, uh, by the way, I, uh, I, I received a, a certificate of, uh, from the Department of Transportation for driving 12 million miles accident-free. Congratulations. Wow. But I don't think I drove 12 million miles. I might have dro dro drove maybe 8 or 9, maybe 10. But I don't think 12. I don't know where they got that number, but... Whatever I, the number is, mind-boggling. I didn't give it to them, but I never had a chargeable accident. I've had a lot of accidents, but none charged to me. I mean, people try to get out of my trailer, people smashing <clears throat> the back of my trailer because they didn't see me, and I'm going down the highway. Right. Well... It's been great talking with you. Thank we you. Uh, thank are grateful you. for your time, and thank you, David Gollin. I'm reaching my hand out here to shake your hand. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I appreciate you uh, 
uh, asking me all this, and if it if it makes somebody feel good with this story, then I'm feeling good.